computer. All right, it is uh, Monday, June 15, and the summer here seems to be, it went from no summer to just feels like it's going really fast. So uh, <laughs> thank you, guys. I, I, I guess you would probably tell the summer by the shrinking pool of faces in our, our Zoom meeting here that people are getting active, and, and that's all good. Uh, so for me, just a quick, in, in uh, Newport, uh, let me do a quick screen share here. This was kind of a monumental day for me. Oh, wait, uh oh no, never mind. Mm. Well, I was going to tee up a video, but whatever. I don't think I teed it up enough. But uh, So I've had this old beater laser, and so it was the last on my boat work list. And uh, I finally buffed out all the green algae on the bottom that had been sitting next to it and the, the spars I kept underneath and the chickens had been roosting on those. So those were covered in chicken shit. And uh, yeah, so everything's back to normal. And I took it for the first time on Saturday and man, did it feel good. It was a beautiful flat day off Gooseberry Island. I think some of you guys know that zone, but uh, it just felt so good to be out. And so uh, luckily in Sail Newport started some laser racing uh, last Monday night. So that's the plan tonight is to go and uh, beat myself up again and see, see how I strive. So anyway, it was good, good to be sailing. It was definitely felt right. So old girl. So, so, but it was ironically enough, the same day that I went sailing, I got this uh, random email from a guy in Seattle um, who was looking for this article that Ed Baird had wrote in 1981. So obviously I had to come into the offices here. Luckily we, you can see behind me, we've got every issue dated back to 1962. So uh, I don't know. This was, was this you on the cover, Ed? It's hard to tell, or is that just? Um... Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> the colored sail. But we love well, it. You know, they did colored sails at the worlds. That was the thing. Whenever you went to a worlds, there were the whole fleet had a color. Yeah. So I think this is. It says uh, this was the solo. Um, what's it called the interclass solo regatta in Barrington. Anybody remember that? I do. Yeah, I sailed in it in uh, 72 and 82. And what was the concept of it? The concept was 10 people got invited and they had three days of racing in three different boats. And one of the days was a mystery boat. So you didn't know what it was single handed. And uh, in 1972, when I sailed it, I ended up second losing to some guy named Robbie Doyle by a point. And uh, Ted Turner was in that regatta and he finished sixth. And at the prize giving, Robbie got the first prize. I got a little smaller pickle dish. And Ted came up and put his arms around our shoulders and said, I don't know who the hell you guys are, but we're all going to sail together someday. <laughs> and that's how I met Ted Turner. And that's how Robbie and I first hooked up with Ted. Yeah. And then I sailed in it 10 years later. And I got second again, this time losing to a guy that I coached at the Naval Academy, again by one point. Paul Van Cleve. So anyway, I have two deuces in that regatta. So they would de, uh, so the three classes, what were they typically, obviously this year was a laser, so it'd be laser sunfish and some other single hander of the day, or what was the deal? Well, the, the first year we did it, um, they had something called a diamond. I don't know what a diamond is. They had a sunfish, and then they surprised us with a uh, Marshall 18 cat boat. And I got an edge because I figured out how to use my spare baton as a hiking stick so I could hike out more than everybody else and everybody else sat in a boat. Mm. So I won the races in the cat boat. And then laser on a few years later, 10 years later, laser was one of the boats. I think sunfish was the other. And uh, it might have something been a called an Apollo, I think it was, an AMF type boat. And they tried to sail without jibs single-handed, and it wasn't the best. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, it sounds like a cool regatta concept, you know, uh, you know, three boats that you, you know, you just swap it, swap through it, and get people sailing in them, and uh, see who does the best. We should, I think there was, there was, there was a guy, a guy named Leeds Mitchell, long gone now. He came up with the concept, and it was pretty popular. No, oh, it's cool. Well, let's relaunch it. See what happens. We'll uh, do some high performance boats. So. I'm going to share a screen here uh, to sort of, uh, that was a, all right. So this was, this was the article that, um, the article in question. So the same issue yet, yeah, special uh, pop out poster from the new SORC, but I'll give you some times. So I thought it'd be fun real quick for, uh, this was words of wisdom from Ed back in his, uh, in his youth. 
about the first hundred yards, which I reread this morning, and is it, it is a fantastic, very simple piece. And so I thought, you know, here here we are, almost thirty years later, uh, or forty. Thirty nine years. Yeah, 30, almost forty years later. Does this still apply, Ed? And so maybe let's. Uh, I think you've had a chance to read it, so maybe share your thoughts um, as we go. I'll keep it on screen. I'm going to scroll down to this nifty chart, which you referred uh, referred to a few times. So what what, yeah. what still work? Yeah, the chart was the whole the whole concept of the thing. Um, yeah, now you have to remember, I wrote this when I was like seven. So, um, <laughs> the, <laughs> uh, no, I was sailing lasers. I was, uh, you know, doing a lot of dinghy sailing, and this was aimed towards dinghy sailing. And basically, you know, the decision matrix for the first couple three minutes of the race. Um, it was a request from John Burnham about, uh, you know, who was the, the, the editor at the time trying to, um, you know, talk about the early part of the race rather than the whole race. Um, so it came up with this, uh, this idea of doing this chart. And it was fascinating to me because I probably learned more by developing this little chart than anybody who read the article would have. Um, <laughs> and I think that that became... Uh, uh, kind of a, a, a theme for me in the things that I taught and the, the, the lectures that I did and the articles that I wrote was that, you know, really what you're trying to get people to do is think about their situation and they can come up with an answer plenty. I mean, there's everybody's smart enough to come up with good, smart answers on the race course. The problem is when you're under pressure, and you're making decisions by emotion, uh, you're not going to make as good of a decision as if you've pre-thought the whole thing. And, um, and that was the idea of this chart, was just to make it um, uh, you know, something that you could think about and really think about your racing. And maybe you disagree with part of this, or maybe, maybe you can come up with a better solution for yourself, but that's the whole point, is to get you thinking about how, how you can do better uh, in this situation on the race course. I love the asterisk note there that assuming near average boat speed is relative to the fleet when not fully concentrating on boat speed. Yeah, we all have to rumble along at a similar speed and not just stop the boat, right? So, yeah. um, but you know, the, the, the thing here was just going from light air and, and steady conditions to stronger winds and shifty conditions. And you know, there's, there's a fair amount of people who do well in one and not the other, and they don't really know necessarily why. And this was sort of exploring some of the, the reasons that maybe, uh, you know, it's different when it's shifty and, and the breeze is on, it's different than when it's light and it's not very shifty, or if it's persistently a large shift compared to uh, small oscillations. And so, you know, I just sort of went through all this um, and, and came up with a, uh, a little bit of a matrix to, to make your decisions. And again, you have to go through this whole article and remember that it's really only the first two or three minutes of the race. It's not talking about how to make a strategy for the whole windward leg or how to deal with getting it uh, into the lineup at the top weather mark or any of that stuff. This is all about how to get yourself out of the mess at the starting area as effectively as possible. Mm. I find it interesting that you give such a high weight to being on the correct tack during that time period, looking at the matrix, uh, and then not such a high priority of, of ability to tack easily. I, I find that fascinating. Well, and I think, you know, it's one way to look at it, you know, you look at the ones and the fives and you think, oh, you know, that's not important. It's not that it's not important to be able to tack but it's less important than the other things on the list at that moment at, at a given moment. Right. And so, um, you know, there was a, the discussion in the article came around things like, uh, yes, you can't tack easily, but that doesn't mean it's not important to tack. If you're going the wrong way and you can't tack easily, you still got to get out of there. Just find a way, bail out, get out. You know, and, and those, all those stories that we've all heard about, you know, you start down near the pen somewhere and there's four of you that are all lined up real nicely and you're, you're just working really hard to get out that little extra bit in front so that you can tack and go the other way. Meanwhile, everybody in the middle that's had an average or bad start has started to tack away and duck people and go off to the right. Wind shifts to the right, they all beat you even though your start was better. 
And the concept there is just, yes, you got off the line maybe on the favored end, but now you got to get going the right way. And even if you can't tack easily, you got to find a way to get out of there uh, and, and do the right thing. And I think that's, that, that, that really boiled through to a lot of the sailing that I did in future years was how important it is to be doing the right thing in the big picture and not worry so much about the immediacy of what's happening right at the moment. So you'd be an advocate that it's okay to dip a couple sterns early just to get yourself on the correct tack. Well, exactly. And especially when you're in a big fleet where you're somewhat anonymous, you know, you're out there just doing your thing, uh, as opposed to, you know, we, we sail a lot of uh, big boat regattas now where there's just eight or 10 boats or maybe 15. And, you know, it's much more difficult to tack and duck a couple of guys and not have one of those guys tack on you. But in a big fleet, especially dinghy racing, you know, 60, 80, 100 boats, you know, you're getting out there, you just got to find a way to get yourself into the, into the zone that allows you to, to play your strategy up the, with the leg. And, you know, you're going to be more anonymous off the starting line than you are later on in the leg when uh, it's clear uh, if you're in the lead or close to it or if you're in the middle or something. You know, people, things start to stretch out and people more focus on one boat at a time. Uh, at the start, you got to get going the right way and doing the right thing. So that, that's where this chart came from. And it's, it's actually interesting that you picked that one out, Dave, because of all the articles that I've written and got, I mean, there's, there's hundreds. Um, that's the one that I've had more comments about than any other by like a factor of a lot. <laughs> it's amazing over the years. Oh, it's it's cool. amazingly yeah, core yeah. thinking, considering What's you that? wrote that when you were what, 24 years old, you know, yeah, I was 20, 22 at the time. Yeah. Experience. You know, the other thing that's interesting to me is that you were able to create this matrix um, based on laser sailing, but I think it actually applies to any sailing. You know, maybe the numbers shift a little bit, but, um, you know, it, it shows you how much laser sailing taught all of us, I think. Yes. It, it really taught us all the elements of sailing that we later needed to be successful. Yeah. Well, I'm going exactly. to, uh, maybe I'll have to laminate it tonight and slap it on the foredeck just to, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, it, it was, it was interesting reading back through it. You know, you can, you can certainly, I would adjust it a little bit for, if I did it again today, but a lot of it is pretty solid still. You, right. ought, you ought to redo it kind of, uh, you know, 39 years later, this is how it held up and I'm yeah. sure you just, a two became a three or something, but I bet it'd be pretty close. Well, it'd be interesting to see, you know, how it applies to foiling and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> well, you know, things have changed a bit and boats are quicker and, but you know, still got to get off the line. It would be interesting to do that same matrix, say for the TP 52 fleet. Um, and just sort of, like you said, it is a little different dynamic with the smaller fleet boats, closer in speed, you right. know, more defensive style of sailing. You know, how would that change things? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But the idea at the time was really to just get people thinking about it, you know, because so much of what was going on back then, and Gary, you were one of the ones who started all the clinics that we all now are just what everybody, I mean, every coach that teaches at a, a junior level, uh, you know, is using drills that you and some of your friends developed, you know, back in the 70s. And and we all started to pick up and use a lot in the 80s. But the culture at the time, no one had coaches. Uh, I mean, or very, very few people. That, that it was really just a few college sailors that had a coach. But, um, you know, we were all out there on our own trying to figure this out. And this was just speaking to, hey, guys, everybody's got to sit back at the, by the fireplace on a winter day and think about how to get off the line better and how to get around the course better. And then you'll do better in the spring. And uh, you know that was the that was the concept of it. Simple enough, yeah. Gary, what was your hey. best? Uh, what do you think is your best column now? One is one that's been sought after again after forty years. God, I I, I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> I, you know, my my uh, writing for Sailing World dates back, believe it or not, to nineteen seventy four. So, but there 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 was a column. Now that you got me thinking about it that I wrote about the tactician, you know, kind of the philosophy of being a tactician and 
how do you make easy, things easy for the helmsman and keep your eyes outside the boat? You're the one person that's not, you know, worrying about trimming or speed. You're, you're kind of out looking at things. So if I, if just off the top of my head, now I got to go back and uh, look at my tactician article about uh, <laughs> what are the dynamics. And, uh, you know, I say this modestly, it, it won't sound it, but I really mean it that way. One of the lucky things in my career is having gotten to be tactician for Ted Turner and Ted Hood and uh, Buddy Melgas and Dennis Connor, you know, all these people bigger than life. And I get to serve as a tactician with them and, and uh, many others over the years. And they all have a little different personality, but you got to kind of adapt to them to make it easy. Even last summer doing tactics with Art Santry on the 12 meter all summer. Uh, was great fun, you know, and, and only once did I take the helm all summer long. He just got all combobulated, discombobulated. I said, would you mind if I steered for one minute? And I got the boat back up to speed. Here you go. And it, everything was okay. And after that, I said, oh, thanks for that. I needed that. It was the only time the entire <laughs> summer. That's so probably that cool. The art of being a tactician, the philosophy behind it. I want to follow up on what Ed said about um, – when you write something down, it becomes more concrete in your own mind. And I certainly have found that um, in my writing that you sort of start with a loose concept. And then when you really get down to something that you think is good enough for other people to hear, um, it's much more solid in your own mind. Absolutely. So you got me thinking here, I, I'm a little show and tell. Here's a series of books that I uh, kept notes of. And I played this game and the game was, uh, what percentage of boats that I read, did I beat in a given year? And I would add up all the places and all the boats I raced against and how many boats I raced against. And at the end of the year, I'd come up with a number to see uh, what my percentage was for the year. And uh, the goal was to have a higher percentage of boats that I beat and then in all of this are all these notes are hard to read, but that became the basis of uh, those clinics ed and articles and books. And I mean, the odd thing now at my getting older age, not old, but getting older age, is that when I was younger, I, I had a lot of really great ideas, just like you did Ed, when you were 22, making that matrix. My writing was terrible. Well, over the years, my writing's better, but the ideas don't come quite as fast as they did. But these notebooks were the were the key at the time, <laughs> taking the time. And I'm sure there's old girlfriends and other things listed in the books too. But anyway. Well, a shout out to um, Dave and not to be self-serving here, but to me, it, um, being able to have the honor to write for Sailing World, which I, in my mind is really the only um, magazine for racing sailors in North America. Um, it's been really great for for myself personally to be able to have that outlet to share my ideas. And I'm sure um, Ed and Gary would say the same thing. So thanks, Dave, for taking all the crap that we write and making sense of it. Oh, that's what I love. You know, that's it's a daily challenge. You know, some reason or another. Actually, I'll, I'll give Ed credit. When the, the few times he does, he, he comes in clean and tight and solid. Jonathan, you're definitely a solid second place. Gary, we're going to work on him a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, so it's uh, no, it's it's great, and um, and we'll, we'll, you know we've been here for a long time, and keep keep chipping at it. So speaking of a long time, I, this is I do love pulling these old issues out. Maybe I'll, I'll um, I can repurpose some, but you get a kick out of this, Gary. This uh, even the IC thirty sevens. You know, this is the um, I don't know if you guys this is the the New York thirty six, huh? Yep. W D shock. No, it's amazing how the boats are different, and. Uh, yeah, I think of the of, of the of this era, there was a lot of this. It's amazing how windsurfing, you know, was such a you know I was still a kid at the time, but how much an integrated part of the sport and how it's uh, is not so much anymore. Yeah, why don't we get Robbie Nash on the call sometime? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah, we'll get him and talk about some of this kite wing stuff that he's been doing. If you guys That'd be super there, cool, yeah, we'll get one to you and get one to Ed as well. See, see if he can master it. <laughs> Bring it on. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, cool. Thanks, gents. Uh, it was a good uh, short check-in. Uh, maybe a quick round the horn here. What's um, what were your sailing plans, Jonathan? You got your double-handed thing uh, coming up. What what's on the sort of the top of the list to get prepped for this race that you're doing? Um, well, actually, this last Saturday there was a a little bit of a warm-up. Uh, a local yacht club <clears throat> organized a race uh, for two to three person crews. It's a sixty mile course um, around Bainbridge and Vashon Islands. Um, which if you live up here, there, there's some pretty narrow passages that you have to negotiate. And um, it's a bit like sailing up the bay in Newport there. Um, anyways, it was really cool. And it turned out to be a great day. Um, I sailed with my friend Jay Renahan. And we just had a lot of fun. It was great to be out there double handed. Um, gave me an excuse to get the autopilot tuned up a little bit better. And it was just so fantastic to have an actual race. <laughs> So is it, what, what, equipment wise, what have you found that you've uh, had to sort of invest in to be ready for this race? Um, my boat's pretty set up for shorthanded. So I've been um, working on upgrading the autopilot. So I've gotten some, um, some of my friends at Brooks and Gatehouse, Navico have, um, have helped me out. I've upgraded my processor, I've got a new pilot brain and and things like that. So I've been playing around with that. It's been really fun. Big deal. Yeah. It's uh, and electronics are um, our big thing, I think, for the Salem World Reader. So uh, welcome any insight you have on, on how to set up the systems. Uh, yeah, man, that, that, that could be a, a future piece because I think more and more people are going to be sailing shorthanded. And so the autopilot is, is a bigger and bigger part of our lives going forward, I think. Yeah, massive. Well, so real quick, it's funny, in the same issue that I've been holding in my hand, uh let's flip it through and these were they have something called the championship roundup part two and i just happened to catch it back in uh you want it was the blue jay nationals <laughs> in london connecticut with 72 boats uh do you know who won this title a uh, one named jay renahan from madison connecticut there you go ask him about that one this is blue jay days so well uh, he's still one of the best sailors i know <laughs> Was he college sailor of the year one year? He may have been, yeah. I think he was. I, I, yeah. I think he was. He went to uh, Kings Point. Right. I think he was college sailor of the year one year. Cool. All right, Gary, and you, real quick, what's the uh, update from Annapolis? And uh, maybe give us a tease on world sailing. What are, they, what are they doing in this quiet COVID time? Well, uh, the good news in Annapolis is we got Wednesday night racing up again, uh, 120 boats or so out there on the water. I don't know if there's social distancing or not, but there's a lot of enthusiasm. They just don't have the big beer party after, after the racing. And uh, when I finish up with you guys, I'm going sailing this afternoon. It's a nice northeaster. It's clear. It's 15 to 18 knots. Perfect day to go out and get my A-sail up and uh, go for a sail. At World Sailing, uh, we have a council meeting coming up next week, and uh, there's a vote going on right now. Uh, about allowing an electronic vote for the elections, which are scheduled for Sunday, November 1st of this year, uh, because it's gonna be very hard to travel to an annual meeting. And we have to get 75% of the member national authorities, countries to approve it. So that vote closes this Friday, and uh, we'll see if we're able to do an electronic vote. Beyond that, frankly, my uh, biggest project at World Sailing is to just make sure that we have that double-handed long distance race in the Olympic Games in 2024 and 2028 because Jonathan and Ed, I know they're thinking about it and they're going to have good partners and uh, go for it. <laughs> Jonathan wants a, one more medal. <laughs> good time to do it then. Good. And uh, all right, cool. Well, Ed, um, some final closing thoughts on what you're going to do. Uh, what's your first regret? You've got to be itching to get something to go in here. Oh, yeah, it's killing me. Um, and, and interesting to hear, you know, the activities where you guys are, because, uh, you know, Florida in the summer is actually, that's our quiet time. Right. Um, and so we're typically gone either up north or Great Lakes or something, um, racing up there or over in Europe. For me, I do a lot of my stuff in, in Europe. And, um, uh, you know, it just gets quiet because it's light air during the day and it's thunderstorms in the afternoon and it's, it's not, it's just hot. Um, but I, as I've said several times on this call, 
there are more people out on the bay than I can remember for a long, long time. Uh, it's not necessarily that they're out racing, but there's people out sailing their boats, there's people out fishing and going, you know, in their, in their motorboats out to the beach and stuff. Uh, it's very active and that's exciting to see. Um, from what I can tell, it, they're, they're behaving responsibly and, and that's very nice. And um, the one silver lining about all of us being uh, slowed down on the, the work side of things is that uh, people have a lot more time for their boats. So uh, hopefully that gives a resurgence to the industry and, uh, and it gets people excited to uh, spend more time doing that. Yes, most definitely. All right. Well, it sounds like we need to get you one of these kite wings and to, to okay. <laughs> simpler Perfect. way to play. Uh, you want foiling or non-foiling? Well, you know, one step at a time, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll start you with the training wheels then. Perfect. All right, good. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen. Um, thank you. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. You do. Yeah, Thanks, Dave. Right. See you guys. Bye, All right, Ed, Jonathan, Dave, thank you. All thank right. you. Have a good one. Bye.